When I was eight years old, I had a gun pulled out in front of me. It was the first day of winter break, and I went to work with my dad, who was a judge. The defendant that day was a semi-professional boxer and an armed robber. He pled guilty to the charges and then walked over to the sheriff. But instead of getting handcuffed, he threw a right hook, breaking the sheriff's jaw, and pulled out a gun. Now, the next few minutes were a bit of a blur, and the man escaped, only to be caught a few blocks away. The next day, the story was in all the papers. But in one particular paper, the story wasn't about the man and his dramatic actions, but the focus was on me, the little kid who was in court when a gun got pulled out. And there was one quote that I said that in different ways has followed me throughout my whole life up until this very moment. I was excited and scared at the same time. <laughs> As I stand here with all of you, I'm excited and a little, little scared. As a marketer, my job is to help people communicate their message to their audience. The best way to do this is by telling stories. Now, telling a story isn't just about what you say, it's also about how you say it. So your tone and your pace and your expression and your body language are all clearly important. Today, I'd like to focus a little bit on the content and structure of telling stories. There is scientific evidence that demonstrates why stories are the best way to communicate. Here's the story. Princeton neuroscientist Dr. Uri Hansen was curious about the connection between communication and brain activity. And his research led to an understanding that human communication is really all about brain chemistry. He conducted experiments where he monitored brain activity based on what an audience hears. When an audience hears information, facts, figures, data, two parts of their brain activate, the vernix area and the Broca's area. These are the parts of the brain that you need in order to decode the meaning to know what the words mean. When someone is told a story, the brain activity is very different. Not only do the vernix and Broca's areas activate, but so does every other part of the brain that the audience would use if they were experiencing the story. It turns out that when a story is being told, the brain activity of the person telling it and the person hearing it mirror one another. It's called neural coupling. So if someone tells you a story about them kicking a ball, your motor cortex activates. If someone tells you a story about the sweet smell of fresh baked cookies, your olfactory cortex activates. There's also a rise in cortisol levels, the stress hormone, which is a very powerful agent for capturing people's attention. The results are that when you tell a story, there's an increase of up to 40% in the audience's understanding and retention than if you were just to give them the information. The conclusion? Story matters and is the most effective way to communicate. Now this may not seem that surprising, and in some ways it shouldn't. We've all been communicating by telling stories since we were little kids. But just because we know something to be true doesn't mean that we incorporate it in our day-to-day -day lives or know the best way to do it. We are all experiencing an epidemic, information overload, also known as infobesity. <laughs> According to IBM Marketing Cloud, 90% of all the data in the world today was created in the last two years. On top of that, our attention spans have been getting worse and worse. The average human attention span used to be 14 seconds. The attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. <laughs> and today, the average human attention span is eight seconds. Our attention span is shorter <laughs> than that of a goldfish. Story matters more than ever as we cope with this dual condition of infobesity and short attention spans. But there's also a story paradox inherent in telling compelling stories. Stories that matter are usually personal to the person telling it, but they also need to matter to the audience. So how do you tell a story about personal details and circumstance unrelated to the audience, but still provide enough value to them so that it matters to them? This is the real challenge, and it's the need for interest-based value. 
Are we all familiar with the most popular fictional radio station, WIIFM? What's in it for me? People and audiences need a reason to care. We need to make the story matter so that we can not only capture their attention, but keep their attention. There's a tool that we can try and use, and there's two ways that we can use to try and address this need for interest-based value. Either we can make the audience the hero, or we can tell a story about a universal theme that resonates with the audience. Let's consider the first. Make your audience the hero. Sounds pretty obvious. Yet businesses often forget about their audience, forget about their customer, and instead like to talk about themselves. If they tell story, it's about their benefits and features and all the amazing things they do. People don't care about what they do. They only care about what they can do for them. Telling stories is prehistoric. It can be traced back to cave drawings. A little more recently, about 350 BC, Aristotle developed kind of the basic structure for stories. All stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. There is a tool that can help businesses tell their story using this basic structure, and also can be applied for personal communication. It's called the story pad. And the P, A, D represent the beginning, middle, and end of the story. The P represents the problem or pain of your customer. And we start with that because we want to make sure that they know they're front and center, they're the central character. The A is the answer that your product or service provides to solve their problem. And the D is the difference that it makes in their business or their life. Successful businesses understand that their message needs to address the needs of their audience, their customer, in order to make it matter for them. Now this can be applied in your personal life. Those people that are important to us, our family, our friends, when we communicate with them, maybe we should think about not telling a story about ourselves, but telling a story about them. Now, I'm going to break the rule just for a minute to tell you a story, and you'll see how it works. So my father likes to say that he's never hit any of his three children, but he did once. I was four years old, and we were at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And I was a wide-eyed four-year-old, looking at all these incredible artistic masterpieces. And one in particular looked really interesting. So I walked over to it, and I was about to touch a $5 million Renoir <laughs> when my dad caught me out of the corner of his eye, raced over, and smacked me away. I forgave my dad. But I have to admit that whenever I see a Renoir, I get a little twitchy. <laughs> now, some people think that my dad was the hero of the story, and he certainly saved my family from bankruptcy. But when my dad tells that story, I feel like the star. I'm the hero, and the story matters to me. And this is the intention we need to think about when we're having communication with people in our personal lives. The second way to address the need for interest-based value is to tell a story with a universal theme. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to abandon the personal nature of the story. It's an opportunity to embrace the story paradox by combining both the macro and micro elements of a story. The macro elements are that universal theme. If you think about my opening story, it was the theme of excitement that's often coupled <coughs> with fear. And then the micro elements are those personal details of the stories only you can tell which help to make that emotional connection with the audience. Now, balancing these two elements, it's not easy. Famous novelist Kurt Vonnegut provides a starting point for how we can start to embrace the story paradox by creating these universal themes. And it doesn't come from any of his novels. It actually comes from his rejected master's thesis in anthropology. His thesis was that every story can be plotted on a graph and that there are a finite number of what he called shapes of stories. The graph kind of looked like this. On the y-axis, on the top you had good fortune, and on the bottom you had ill fortune. And on the x-axis, on one side you had the beginning of a story, and on the other end you had the end. Now he plotted about eight different stories. Let's consider one. It's called Man in a Hole, though as Vonnegut said, it need not be about a man nor a hole. It's about a person whose life's going okay. 
until some action occurs and it brings he or she down into this hole of misfortune. And they stay there until some other action takes them back out of the hole and to a better place than they even started. This is a really good shape for businesses to tell their story, and it actually aligns with the story pad. The man is the customer who has some sort of problem or pain that takes them down into this hole of misfortune. Then your product or service provides the answer that brings them out of the hole and it makes a difference in their life and brings them even further than where they started. Vonnegut's Shapes of Stories provides a framework for how we can start to tell stories that have a shape and a universal theme. We can then shade in those shapes with personal details and then provide that color and context and authenticity. A final story to bring all the elements together. It has a beginning, middle, and end, a universal theme, and the audience is clearly the hero. The audience of this story is you. Once upon a time, you woke up this morning, looked at your calendar, and saw that you were scheduled to come to a TEDx talk. You remember signing up for it and thinking that the program looked compelling. But now you're having second thoughts. You didn't sleep so well. You got some work to do. And the idea of just coming home and relaxing is really appealing. So you're kind of stuck in indecision. So you go through your day, and you start to get some work done. You have a really nice lunch with a friend of yours. By the afternoon, you're feeling great. You're like, you know what? I am going to go to that talk. So you come, and you mill about, and you find a seat. You sit down, you wait to be inspired. Speakers come up and share their ideas. And you learn something new. Or you learn a new perspective. And you realize you made the right decision by coming. Then this story guy comes up and tells you a story about a gun and the brain and Renoir and how to improve your personal communication. And you leave the event with a buzz and you go home and you're thinking about all these things and then over the next few weeks you realize you're thinking more in story. You're telling more and better stories. You're achieving more and you're connecting with people on a deeper level. Story matters now in all your personal communication and your stories matter to those that matter most, your audience. And you and your audience live happily ever after. <laughs> The end. Thank you.